Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. I'll go ahead and, I guess, stop right there. That's verse 46, uh, Brian. And so here we have the Jews grumbling. Uh, and so why are they grumbling about him? And how is his answer per per <laughs> pertinent? Earlier, as we've been uh, studying through this, we saw in John chapter 6 that Jesus identified himself as the bread of life, the bread that comes down from heaven. One of the themes in the book of John that I think is very interesting is that there's a big question about where is Jesus from? Uh, we haven't got there yet, but in the next couple of chapters, we'll get some background uh, information, some filler there um, that, the, that the Jews ha have been trying to ascertain where Jesus is from. And it pertains to the prophecies of where the Messiah comes from. Uh, so what's interesting about the book of John is that John doesn't actually fill us in about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. He expects that we've read the other gospel accounts, and we already know that. Um, but Jesus is going to talk a lot about where he's from, and he's going to be saying, he's never going to say, I'm from Bethlehem, so don't worry, that prophecy is fulfilled, which is what they're, they have a great deal of concern about. What he's saying is, I'm actually from heaven. He'll say that several times, and he'll talk about the idea of saying, I know where I'm from. Uh, I know where I'm going. Uh, these are some important statements that Jesus makes. And so here Jesus has said, when it comes to where is he from, he says, well, I'm I'm from heaven. And that's very offensive because that is Jesus effectively claiming that he is, he is from God. Um, a little further on, as he claims to be the son of God, they'll take that and, and attempt to kill him for blasphemy over that because he'll, by claiming he is the son of God, they'll understand that he is... Uh, uh, he is living, that he is, in fact, God in the flesh. And that'll be a very offensive thing as well. So so they've taken great offense to this. Um, they, they have seen that Jesus is saying something that they're offended about. They've clearly done some research. They even know Jesus's father and mother's name. Um, we get a sense of that back in John chapter 1, when they were investigating John the Baptist. And it makes sense. They've investigated Jesus too. They know all about his family and, and who he is and where he's from. Um, but Jesus' statement here about being from heaven, well, that's a much more uh, complex statement that, that that fills in with a great deal of frustration. You know, uh, looking at this, uh, I think that's people's nature is that people remember who, people who knew you as a kid kind of remember you that way. And, uh, and here, you know, Jesus is making a grand claim uh, of who he is. And they seem concerned about that uh and certainly uh i guess concerned is maybe a, a great understatement uh, of that because they're they're very concerned and now not only uh that but as you pointed out he's talking about well you think i came from nazareth was born in bethlehem you know uh that about joseph and mary but the point is that really, if you want to know uh, the absolute truth about this, I'm from heaven. And so uh, that that should open up their eyes. That should cause them to ask more questions, uh, to seek a little little harder than what they are. Uh, John, I've, we've kind of been uh, going on, but I see you're back. And so I'll kind of hand off right to you. Oh, that's fine. I appreciate that. Um, good discussion. Good discussion so far. Looking at, we've got several who have joined us today, Caleb, Eileen, Marcia, and others. Yeah, appreciate y'all getting started with that. Had a phone call come in and thought it was gonna be something of a different nature and, and it wasn't and so, but anyway, one thing to, to kind of, as we get, how far did you read down the verse 46? 46. Okay. You know, one of the hardest things, I think, for the people to understand at this point, not really the hardest thing to understand, but he's, this whole passage is in the form of, is much like his parables, okay? It's not a parable, but the figurative language all throughout here, they're not going to understand. And you've, you've already talked about that when he, he made the statement there that I have come down from heaven. Um they're not going to have a comprehension of what he means by that. Let's see. Um, but let's look at verse 44, 43 for a moment. He says, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father, let me bring it up there. There we go. Unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. 
Brian, it doesn't look like he is headed in any direction of anything that's going to be easy to understand <laughs> over the next few yes, minutes. I, I will say, oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead, Paul. Um, I will say what's interesting about this um, is that this is actually part of a conversation that's through the book of John about God drawing men to him. This passage, of course, sometimes is is seen by the Calvinist mind as an evidence that, you know, God reaches out to some people and pulls and other people he doesn't. But if you actually look at what John has said already in the book of John, uh, you would actually understand very well that that's not at all what he's saying. Back in chapter 3 and verse 14, when we were reading Jesus talking to Nicodemus, Jesus makes a statement in verse 14 that as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now we put a pin in our mind there, and we come to this passage about God drawing men, and then we jump to John chapter 12 and verse 32. And in John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus makes a statement, if I'm lifted up, which from John chapter 3 we could tie to his being crucified, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. How does the Father draw men? By putting Jesus on the cross. That's actually what Jesus is saying through these series of statements in the book of John. It's not as though the Father reaches out and touches the heart of some person and draws them to him. By putting Jesus, lifting him up, like Moses lifted up the serpent, by lifting Jesus onto the cross, God draws men. Doesn't mean all men will come to him, but it means all men are given the opportunity to come to him because putting Jesus on the cross is God's way of bringing all men together. So it's important that we get a sense of from John chapter 6 and verse 44 uh, that this passage defines, defines itself in the book of John that drawing men is God's act of, of putting Jesus on the cross. It's not anything other than that. And uh, we want to put this passage together in that context. All right, Paul? I was, I was thinking about this and that it seems to be kind of an unusual conversation that takes place and maybe uh some of our listeners can help me out maybe uh, you fellows can help me out they seem hung up on where jesus comes from but jesus says no one can come to me and so they're concerned about where he comes from he's concerned about people coming to him uh and i don't know if the point here is that i'm from heaven and so come to me so that you can have heaven. He does talk about uh, eternal life in verse 47. Whoever believes has eternal life, and he talks about being that bread of life. But isn't that a kind of a... It's not just to me a, the easiest to read conversation that Jesus has uh, here uh, with them that they want to know where he comes... or they're hung up on where he comes from. That He said, I came from heaven, but he is focused on uh, them coming to him and coming to the father and the father drawing them through through that teaching i don't know what do you guys think that's really interesting um i hadn't really thought about that before that, that you know where'd you come from uh you come to me that's a because there there's several come to me statements in john aren't there i hadn't really noticed that before but that that's very interesting that is um any thoughts? Let us know what you have to think about this. You can send us your um, questions and comments. Don't send it to Caleb. Didn't mean to bring his <laughs> comment up there, old one. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. I am monitoring those as we go through the course of our study. You can also email us individually. If you have joined us via the Facebook, our Facebook page, you can comment on the live stream there. If you're on our YouTube channel, then you can drop a comment on the live stream there too. Okay. Um, so th this was a big hang up, Paul, for the people though, because they could only see Jesus as a physical man. You know, we, we have, we have the, the hindsight of being able of, of perfect understanding, if you would, as far as what the scriptures reveal to them, they were trying to figure out where did this, the idea of God sending him was more along the lines of God sending a prophet. You know, and so they would want to know where he came from. But I like the point you are making. They should have been more concerned with the fact of where they were going to. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about also, Brian, connect to verse 45. Talk about unless the father who sent me draws him. I've had individuals, and I'm sure you have too, kind of use this as the idea. 
of um, the idea of all we need to do is believe and God will draw people almost the level of predestination, you know, draw people in to believe in Jesus. But verse 40, 45, along with what you've already described from um, John 12, I believe it was a while ago. 12, right. 12. Um, verse 45 there, really, he, he pulls upon the writings of a prophets to explain how that drawing takes place. You know, I actually just did a sermon on this uh, passage recently, just talking about how it is that uh, if, if God is communicating to us through the Word of God, and if the Word of God is inspired by God, if it is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit who is God, then when we are taught of the things of God in the Scriptures, we are actually being taught by God. Um, and so uh, we actually talked about it in that sense, how this could be applied that way. I think what's important to say, too, is that there is a sense where Jesus... Um, one of the underlying themes of the entire book of John, and even in this conversation, is that Jesus is God. So this conversation that they're having with Jesus is them being taught by God. Um, you know, that that also could be a, a fulfillment of this. Um, but Jesus is kind of, I think, talking about the idea that this drawing is coming from the Father. That because the Father has sent the Son, that means it is it originates with the Father. And that this... Uh, communication with the Father. It's kind of interesting how Jesus more than once will say to somebody, hey, you learned that from the Father. You might think of Matthew 16 when Jesus is talking to Peter and Peter confesses Jesus in the Christ, is the Christ. And, and Jesus says, hey, you didn't learn that from flesh and blood. You learned that from the Father. Um, and the implication is that the Father authorized this information to be manifested in him. So the idea is we're learning from the Father. So What's, in, what's neat about verse 45 is we could say that being taught by God is being taught by the Father, uh, who manifests all these things, including Christ's coming. It's being taught by the Son, Jesus, who is God, who is teaching right there on the spot. And it's also for us today manifested as yeah. being taught by the Holy Spirit, who is God. So you have a, a threefold way that this passage is, is manifested. I think it's just a... Uh, I, almost a goosebump kind of passage. It just gets you really excited to say, "Wow, this is really profound." You know, we're not we're not being taught of men. You know, when we're opening the Word of God and we're we're pouring through the Word of God, we are being taught by God. That's profound. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Any thoughts? You know, earlier, and this is not really related to our study. When I was trying to see who would talk first, Brian or Paul, reminding me of being at a four way stop this morning. <laughs> all right so the focus is jesus they need to come to him they need to listen to him and the father is drawing them to him the reason is found in verse number 47 most assuredly i say to you he who believes in me has everlasting life and that's what that's where jesus is trying to get the people to to him, go back to what he's already spoken of earlier. In a little bit, he's going to continue with this, 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 uh, I guess, imagery, for lack of a better term, where he will describe himself as the bread of life and so forth. Um, he is the center point that people need to come to, and he's going to explain to us why as we go through the text here. But we need to read this, don't we? Paul, did you read? Uh, you read a while ago, didn't you? I did. Brian, let's let's continue with uh, verse forty-seven and let's read. Well, let's go ahead. And we'll stop at verse fifty-two. That kind of begins the little next section there, but that'd be a good little cliffhanger point to stop. All right, uh, forty-seven through fifty-two, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? All right. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Let's take a moment and bring a comment in. David Clark had made a comment a little bit earlier that I think would be important to drop in at this point, especially with what we are about to discuss. Uh, David says, God is talking spiritually and they are looking at things. They're talking physically. 
And that's what's creating a sense of blindness in their understanding. Yeah. Any thoughts? I think it's, it this, says it very well. That's a very good, yeah. uh, very important observation. Absolutely. Now, could this be connected to a little bit? Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 2 about the veil that still lies over their heart to this day with the reading of the law? Maybe. Yeah, I could, I could certainly see that. Um, that uh, and, and what's interesting is, you know, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians about the idea that the, the, the gospel is a stumbling block to the Jews. Uh, the Old Testament is the veil, you know, that they're blinded by. And I think what what David points out, this the, the carnal nature, the physical nature, right? carnal can sometimes have a negative impact. I just mean like the physical nature of the old law was the thing that I think ties them up so often, these physical requirements, and Jesus is speaking about the spiritual. I think that's a great observation. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's the 2 Corinthians 2? 2 Corinthians 3, I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good thoughts. Good comments on that. Let's come back now to our text. Paul, do you have anything to share as we go into him? Him talking about he is, he says, I am the bread of life. And then he's going to use the manna as a great example of, um, well, okay. Let me ask you this. Sorry. I'm kind of bouncing around here. Sure. This passage helps us to see, would you think that manna was intended or served as a type anti-type? Of Christ himself? Certainly uh, everything, I mean, the Old Testament, the whole purpose there is pointing to Christ, to teach us lessons about God and to point us to Christ. And certainly that's true. Uh, they were sustained in the wilderness uh, by the bread that God gave. And so we are sustained by the bread that comes from heaven, uh, Christ, that it was... Um, all they really needed, uh, Christ is all we need. I realize they eventually got quail because they were not satisfied with, with the manna, but it, it sustained them, it kept them alive, uh, it gave life uh, in that sense. So there, there's lots of ways in which Jesus is the bread of life. Uh, and so, and I, I suppose the primary one is that the manna came from heaven. Uh, it was bread from heaven. And so Jesus is bread from heaven. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see. Any other thoughts about this? Ryan, do you have any thoughts maybe from Deuteronomy? Well, so I was just thinking about that. Uh, you said, what was the purpose of manna? And it's interesting that manna had a spiritual purpose. Uh, when Moses is talking to the Israelites at the end of their journey in Deuteronomy, and he's saying, hey, you know, you've eaten manna for 40 years now. He says, remember, God gave you manna so that you would know man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Kind of interesting, Jesus quotes that when he's talking to Satan and Satan's trying to tell him to turn stones into bread. But I, I've always thought what's so neat about that is that verse really speaks to what Jesus is saying right now, because that's really what Jesus is talking about. The bread from heaven, he is the living bread, the bread of life. He's talking about his word. That's what he's going to tell us in chapter six and verse uh, uh, 64, 65, 66. Uh, he's going to say, it's my words that are life. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what Moses was talking about when Moses said, you know what man really is about? It's about living by the word of God. And God speaks man into existence and it rains down on you and you're sustained by it. But what God wants you to know is, is that it's his, it's what he says that keeps you alive. And here is Jesus speaking the word of life. And he says, that's what man is really about. But, but again, going about what David said, they're really con caught up in the physical concept of manna, and they don't eat, they have no concept of Moses's, you know, manna is really about living by the word of God, which Jesus is now using as his analogy to say, hey, and, and to say this statement that, that understandably, if you're looking at it from purely a physical standpoint, is, is an offensive statement. Jesus says, you're going to have to consume me, um, you know, but Jesus is the living word of God. That's John 1 and verse 1. So we have to live by the word of God. That's what Jesus is really talking about. But it's a real it's a real uh, confusing way that if you're stuck in a carnal mind, uh, and I always think of Paul talking to the Corinthians saying, if you're in a natural mind, you're not going to understand the things of God. Yeah. That the, here they are in this carnal mind of, well, it must be the physical things he's talking about. And they haven't, they haven't understood that God has explained to them already what man was really about. That's a great footnote in Deuteronomy 8.3 in regards to this conversation. 
it's a good explanation of it. Um, so the next phrase is where he stumbles up. And, and what you said, Brian, you've already alluded to that. He says, the bread that I shall give you is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So automatically that sounds a little bit odd in their minds. Okay. And probably is something that would, could be easily distorted by religious teachers in the years to come there. But what do you think his fundamental point when he says the bread that I give you is my flesh, he's not talking about to consume literally his flesh, but what is he talking about? I don't think, uh, I, you know, I know I've heard people talk about this passage in regard to the Lord's supper. I don't think that's any reference there at all. Yeah. Um, uh, and said, I think that just as in the, maybe the manna, the bread of life illustration continues that just as they were sustained and, and their they were given life through uh, the bread that rained down from heaven that through Jesus's flesh through his sacrifice I think that maybe it's a picture of his sacrifice that there would be spiritual life there would be eternal life that would be made available uh, verse 47 he whoever believes has eternal life I am the bread of life. Uh, your fathers ate the manna. They died, but the bread I'm going to give you, you'll not die. And so here he goes on to say that the bread is my flesh. Well, when you partake in the sacrifice that Jesus offered, uh, when you, just as he died and he was buried and he arose, you die to sin, you're buried in baptism, you rise to walk in newness of life. I realize the gospel hasn't been preached at at this point in, in the teaching. But as you see that, uh, he says that there, there is life through the sacrifice that I'm going to be. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good explanation. No, I, I, uh, uh, I, right, right along with Paul. I mean, it's, it's right to say, we're not talking about the Lord's Supper here. I heard a preacher once though say, this isn't talking about the Lord's Supper, but the Lord's Supper is talking about this. Um, and I thought, oh, that's a neat way to put it. In other words, what we're commemorating with the Lord's Supper, the death of Jesus and, you know, his blood purchasing a new covenant, that's really what Jesus is talking about here, that through his death, we would have life. And through his blood, uh, you know, he would purchase us a new life. And the Lord's Supper commemorates that. Um, so it's interesting when the pre preacher made that comment that, you know, this isn't talking about the Lord's Supper, but the Lord's Supper is talking about this. I thought, yeah, that that makes sense. That's an interesting way to put it. That really is. See, if you'd said that in private, not kept it public, we all could have taken it and run with it as if it was original thought on our parts. <laughs> Actually, that is a really good point. Good point. All right. Any thoughts or comments? How about from you in the chat room? Do you have any thoughts about what we're looking at today? If so, we'd love to hear from you. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, you can always send us email, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually, and we'll do our best to get back with you if you have a question or something that you'd like for us to talk about, we could definitely, definitely do that. All right. That being said, let's see, bear with me for just a moment. Um, maybe, maybe our listeners know are familiar with the Catholic doctrine, the false doctrine that comes out of here. I'd be curious if somebody could name that for us. Uh, uh, that's a question to the audience. What is the Catholic doctrine that is pulled out of this passage? Be curious um, to hear them say it. Side note, while, while y'all contemplate this, um, Marsha is watching us through our website. And on the website, I've got a comment section where they can submit a comment. And uh, Marsha basically sent something very similar to what David uh, said earlier. The Jews were looking at this as physical, but it is spiritual. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So do you have hey, an answer uh, for Brian? Brian, that's a very substantive point. Okay. I'm trying to think of another way to come back and help out with that too, but uh, any it's kind of going to sound strange no matter how we try. You got to be careful, especially with the first part of the word, because now these days it could be taken as offensive and YouTube would go like flag, you know. Um, got to flag that video for that. Okay. Y'all know what it is, don't you? I appreciate them, Brian, Brian oh. transferring our minds to think about that. <laughs> because it is very substantive. 
<laughs> That's all the hits I'll, you're going to get. <laughs> I'll quit now. <laughs> we, right. We've got the answer. From my favorite, my favorite person in the chat, in the audience. Your mother? My mother. My biggest That's fan. That's right. So. Uh, Aline hmm. Haynes put down transubstantiation, uh, which is a core Catholic doctrine, uh, yeah. which is the teaching that Jesus is in the Lord's Supper, Jesus's blood and uh, Jesus, the, the elements of the Lord's Supper, literally. Um, well, they, they actually, the Catholic might say spiritually, um, acknowledging that they're not going to have any kind of proof of that. Uh, Caleb draws us to the Eucharist, which is the, the place where they take the, the transubstantiation to take place. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, if you, if you ever talk to someone who's Catholic, they'll walk you over to this passage and they'll say, Hey, there's nothing. Um, I, I'll tell you what, I, I had a conversation with a Catholic once. Let me just say this. And he said, look, there's nothing here that says this is literal symbol or is, is uh, symbolic. This is literal. And I said, well, that means that if you partake of these things, literally, then you should literally be able to live forever. Do you live forever? And he said, well, no, that's symbolic. So <laughs> I said, well. Maybe maybe you ought to think about that. Let me pop up. So thanks uh, for the answer. I appreciate that. Yeah, and that's what you were referencing, Caleb. I popped in Eucharist. Is uh, yeah, good point. Good point. All right. So with that being said, verse fifty-two kind of starts the next section, and let's look at that real quick, and then we'll um, I'll read the following section there. When the Jews heard this, they quarreled among themselves and they come back to this clear misunderstanding because they're so limited in the way that they were considering what he was saying. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They took it in a very literal form. This is why they missed the parables. This was why he preached in parables because some would understand and some would not. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the next section here real quick. And y'all be looking ahead. David has dropped um, a question into the chat room and on Facebook side. So we'll come back to that in a moment. I'll start reading there in verse 53. There we go. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Uh, one more, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. All right. Let's come back here to the text. That was a little bit longer, just a little bit in the lengthier reading. Before we talk about that, do we have an answer for David's question? He says, do Catholics partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday like we do? That's a good question. Oh, go ahead, Paul. Paul's got the answer. I, I don't know that I have the definitive answer, uh, but I'll say it's my understanding they take of it more often than that. Uh, that uh, it could be uh, every day uh, if they would want to go and and participate in a mass. Uh, but I I am not the um, authority on that, and so Brian may have a lot better information to share. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Anytime it's my understanding, anytime they're having a mass ceremony, M A S S, a mass they are actually going to be partaking of communion. Now, what's tricky is sometimes just the priest partakes of communion. Uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the distinction is when the priest does it and when the whole congregation does it. But um, uh, I believe they, you know, I believe, as Paul said, they take communion up to seven days a week. Pew Research, according to a quick all-knowing Google search, so you got to be careful now, this is post- AI introduction, not pre-AI introduction. It says the church recommends that Catholics receive communion every time they attend mass and about four in 10 Catholics, that's 43%, say they do so. Overall, 77% of Catholics report taking communion at least some of the time when they attend mass, while 70% say they never do so. Interesting, okay. All right, good question, good question. <clears throat> 
Whereas we partake of it on the first day of the week, as per the biblical example in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, um, as a weekly reminder of the price that Jesus paid upon the cross of Calvary. And as the apostle said, as often as, as Jesus said, and Paul quoted, as often as you do this, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Actually, that's Paul's statement about what Jesus said. All right. So now let's muddy the waters a little bit more for these people. Okay. He goes a little bit. And, and ultimately, it's, it's, you might compare this to separating the wheat from the chaff. Because when this is done, he's going to lose a number of followers because what he's telling them is too difficult. And in this section here, he comes right out and says, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Um, Paul, on the spot, these people hearing this, this was going to be difficult for them to understand. Jesus, I think even as you were reading it, I was thinking that if, if I were to hear him say this mm -hmm. and try to uh, listen to it ob objectively, I think he even leads them to the idea that he's not talking about eating, being a cannibal, eating flesh mm -hmm. and drinking blood. Uh, because when he says that it's uh, my flesh is, is true blood and uh, my flesh, I'm sorry, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And then he says uh, in a different spot that it's, um, oh, it, it ends in, in indeed. Uh, so um, I was looking there. At verse 55. Yeah, I may be reading, uh, because I'm reading out of the ESV, I may have heard you read out of the New King James and that may be mm -hmm. why. I'm doing that. So I, I think that, that he's saying, yes, you know, uh, we're not talking about uh, eating physical flesh or drinking physical blood, but, but he says this really is uh, a food that nourishes, uh, and it really is something that you have to partake of, not, not partake of like the Lord's Supper, but partake of in your life. Uh, and, uh, so I think that's the, uh, I'm not, I'm not describing it very well, but I, when you read it, I thought it's kind of obvious to me, Jesus is telling them, no, it's not, it's not, uh, food in the sense that, uh, like steak and potatoes, but it mm -hmm. is, it is food that is part of your life. It, it's part of what sustains you. It's part of what gives you, uh, spiritual, uh, sustenance. Um, I just thought that emphasizes that he's speaking in a figurative way <clears throat> that he's using an illustration there. Uh, <clears throat> just like Brian said, that it's not that you never physically die, uh, but it, it's all one big picture, spiritual food, spiritual drink, spiritual life uh, that he's speaking of. Okay. Maybe somebody else can say it better than I'm, I'm, I'm doing so. No, you're, you're doing fine. Um, quick note, uh, comments come in from Marsha again. This is all a foreshadowing of all things that happened. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So think about this for a moment. Um, if we're looking at with what Jesus' statement, basically they're tell, he's saying they need to partake of him and everything that is him. Now go back to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is a very figurative sense where what he's telling them is to partake of all that is him, everything that he teaches, not just everything that he teaches, but also the very motivation of his life, the very love that he had for the father, the very submission within his life of submitting into the will of the father, everything that comes from him, they are to partake of and allow it to, if he, and if they do, then they will abide within him and he will abide within them. Um, that may be a, a way of looking at that. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what's kind of important is that word abide actually, John, I think that's what is really important. And I, and I'll pause here for to say, 
Jesus is going to explain what he's saying when people come back to ask him. And that's one of the things about parables. Uh, when Jesus speaks in parables, what he's looking for is people to say, can you explain this to us? Can you help us to understand this? And Jesus is always ready to explain things, you know, and that's maybe that's one of the things about being a, a, a disciple of Jesus is that sometimes you hear something that's hard to understand, stick with it. It'll become clear. So Jesus is trying to say this is the the connection of um, uh, of abiding in Him. That actually mm -hmm. is the the real core statement. He says, "You you know, if you partake of this, uh, verse fifty six, you know, you abide in Me." Well, in John fifteen, Jesus is going to elaborate on abide. It's where He gives us, "I am the vine," and He'll say, "If you abide in My word, and My word abides in you, then I'm in you." And then he'll say, if you keep my commandments, then I'm we're abiding in one another. And so his word, his commandments, that's really, of course, what he's talking about. That's this is why we when we talk about the Bible, we call the Bible the bread of life. You know, we sing a really nice song, Break the Bread of Life. Um, it's one of my favorite songs because and it's talking about the word of God and Jesus's words. He hasn't said it yet, but in a couple of verses, he's going to say it's my words that are life. That's what I'm talking about. The bread of life. My words are the bread of life. The things I'm telling you are life. Um, and if you abide in my words, if you do what I say, if you live uh, my way, you have life. That's that's not hard to understand, but he's using an image that's a little graphic, but it's also very, you have to make a choice, you know, because if you just say you abide in my word, somebody says, oh, okay, I abide in his word, There, I'm done. No, you have to consume, it has to consume you. Uh, you, it has to be everything and you have to be totally committed to it. It's not merely a, oh yeah, I'm going to call myself a Christian. It's a, this defines my life that Jesus is talking about. And what a great way to image it, you know, by saying, well, it's like, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You know, that's how serious I am about this. And that's, um, you know, and, and what's important to understand is that that's the level of commitment that most people don't want to give Jesus a total all consuming commitment. And that's the only acceptable way to have eternal life. So it's a neat, it's a neat image Jesus is giving. And, and I think you're exactly right, John, when you said this is kind of weeding things out. The unserious people, the people that are just there because he fed them, this is going to drive them away. Um, but the people that, that say, no, 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 I think Jesus is more than just a free meal. I think he's the way of life. They're going to stick around. And Jesus is going to make it clearer for them. Okay. All right. Now I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna bring a question in that kind of came in through through the the comments uh, from from again from Marsha. How would this relate to baptism? Okay. You you, th you think about what Jesus commanded in Mark sixteen sixteen, and a greater further explanation is seen in Peter's statement Acts two thirty eight, and then of course Romans six. Paul kind of brings that in as well. Um, but any any thoughts on that, on that question? You know, I think it does relate to baptism indirectly, though. Um, okay. And, I, and I always, I've often said, I think the same way that the same way that the Lord's Supper indirectly has connects us to baptism. When we take the Lord's Supper, what do we do? We take the bread first, which is Jesus's body, his death. And we take the fruit of the vine, which is his blood, which is life. And when we're baptized, we die. You know, we, we put to death the old man and he's buried. And then a new man arises in the newness of life, in the covenant purchased by the blood of Christ, covenant of Christ. So this idea of death and life, flesh and blood, um, the, in the flesh is death, in the blood is life. When, when I come to Christ, I'm dead, I'm buried, I arise alive. The, 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 in John 20, the first resurrection is what it's called. And so there's that kind of connection to death and life that's a part of baptism, death and life. Um, of course, we could say it's the bread of life that is leading me to be baptized. I mean, I, I, I guess we could also say it that way too, but I, but more more likely, I think the indirect connection is the element of, of the flesh being death and the blood being life. And Jesus in the flesh puts to death the enmity between God and himself by dying. And then by being raised up and the blood, the newness of life purchases a new covenant relationship with God. And then I reenact that when I'm baptized um, that, that then connects me into that. Um, so I could see it like that. Like I said, that they both parallel the same images of death and life, uh, might be, okay. might be a connection. I would say. That's a good answer. I think that'd be a really good answer. Um, one more thing to kind of consider with that is, um, there is a bit of symbolism 
I say a bit of symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism used here to convey the greater point. And, and even in baptism, you know, Peter explains, it's not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but it's an answer of good conscience towards God. We do this because it is what he has told us to do. Because if we are going to be completely following him, we will obey him. But it's also that appeal to God for a good conscience. So anyway, I like your answer better though. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see. Eileen brings in a good point. Let's bring this up here real quick. She said, John talks about living water, born again by water and spirit, manna, uh, blood, fruit of the vine, um, carnal elements that represent the spiritual. And that's a good explanation of that. Again, coming back to that, the symbolism, using the carnal elements to represent the spiritual that takes place. Okay. All right, we've lost Paul for a moment. He had to step away. And one more thought, Brian, as we get to this last section here, or not last section, but what we've just read. Let me bring it up on the screen real quick. There we go. He says, as the, li as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. So he talks about the living Father has sent him. He says, I live because of the Father. So then the other one who feeds on me will live because of my father. In other words, much like what he said before, if you receive, if anyone receives you receives me and anyone who receives me receives the father that sent me there. But then in verse 58, this is a bread which came down from heaven. This is a true bread that's come down from heaven. It's not like a manna, the days of the manna when the fathers ate of it, yet they would still die. Whoever takes of what Jesus gives, takes of Jesus, abides in Jesus, and Jesus abides in them, they will live forever. He who eats this bread will live forever. And again, not a literal where we will never die within this flesh, but the eternal life that we have with God. Um, okay, any thoughts about that, Brian? Okay, all right. Let's see. Let's go ahead and plan. We're at the just shy of the top of the hour. My fault that we got started late. Um, I apologize for that. And we won't hold you over. And I think this will probably be a good stopping point. Verse 59. Uh, we will real quick. Let's just throw this in and then we will pull the stage to a close. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum, kind of coming back to this idea if he stayed a good bit in Capernaum and much of the teaching in this case of point specifically was done there in the synagogue. Um, Brian, real quick, I know I said we were done, but one more thought. Do you think this would have aggravated the situation even more so that he taught this in the synagogue? So by the way, I actually, I'm a little, sometimes I'm a little confused by this because what's interesting okay. about this whole lengthy conversation is that it starts out in the country. You know, when they, mm -hmm. when all the people that follow Jesus over and it, it seems to end in the synagogue. Now, what I actually think is happening, um, and this is a Brian, I think this is, okay. we have truth factor and then we have uh, a supposition factor. Was that what we said? I kind of think that what we're seeing is a, is a compressed conversation. I think, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure. really confident that most of the gospel writers take a lot of Jesus's teachings and kind of compress them. And I think what we're seeing is a couple of conversations compressed together um, even though it flows as one conversation. And that's why it starts seemingly out, you know, in this country setting and it ends in the synagogue. And I think that it might just be saying Jesus is saying this or saying it again. That's also very reasonable too, but saying this in a synagogue. So, so your question is, if is saying this in a synagogue going to be something that's really going to disturb people? Yeah, I think so. Um, um, and I think what's interesting, it's in the synagogue in Capernaum. He his record in Capernaum synagogue has not been good. Uh, Luke chapter yeah. four, first time he spoke in it, they tried to kill him. So yeah. um, kind of interesting that his discussing these things in the Capernaum synagogue. That's a pretty controversial place. And Jesus has said Capernaum is a place where they don't want to receive him. They don't want to hear what he has to say. It's, it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty uh, uh, problematic. So that's worth considering. That's a good point. Okay. And, and, and it's, it's a good clarification as a general over our compression of what he's taught because of where it began and then where it ends here in the text. Yeah. 
You know, I'm mistaken. I said Luke 4 was Capernaum. It's not. It mentions Capernaum, but uh, um, I'm mistaken. Let me clarify that. It wasn't Capernaum. It was uh, it was his hometown of Nazareth that he made that first. They tried to kill him the first time. but um, Oh, where he said this day, my, my this, apologies. this prophecy is fulfilled in your presence. That's it. I was I, I was mistaken. I was okay. thinking Capernaum, and it does mention Capernaum, but it's not. It's not. I'm mistaken. Uh, everybody mark your book. I'm wrong. It's... <laughs> Need a calendar back to a big old stamp on Mark it. Mark the know. moment. Yep. All right. Well, I think that'll probably be good for today. Uh, Paul, do you have any th- final thoughts about that? No, sorry. I got called away for a second. That's okay. It's happening today all over the place. <laughs> it's keeping us from having a substantial discussion. Okay. And my, my, the ca- my camera did something weird earlier, so that's why my color now looks odd. The main driver for it, I guess, crashed, and so it's not doing the the special stuff on the side. But let's plan next week to start with verse 60 of John chapter 6. Now, when we get to this next section, we see what we've alluded to when we began the study. The people are going to find, many of his disciples will find this very difficult. And this will come back to this idea of them following him because he fed them following them because of physical reasons and not thinking and understanding the greater spiritual needs that they have and that he came to fulfill. So we'll start next week, John chapter six, verse 60. We should be able to make it to the end of the chapter, hopefully, (laughs) and then get on into chapter seven. All righty. Well, I think that's it for today. Be sure to like and subscribe. Um, That way you can receive notifications whenever we go uh, live in our studies and you can join us. We really appreciate you being here and your time and your attention. And if you're watching this at a later point in time, you can still contact us, send your thoughts and comments to questions at truthfactorlive.com. We'd love to hear from you. Love to be able to sit down and talk with you about the wonderful word of God. All righty, well, that's it for today. So we will see everyone again next Thursday, 11 o'clock. Central Time, right back here at truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.